gosh, I'm, I'm being forced to be tethered down. People who know me know I work the room and I go about, but people have asked me to sort of stay in position because their life will be more easy. Uh, before I stand, start off, I have two things to start with, which I didn't think was in. First of all, I've written up there, keep in mind when I'm talking about this, this is with a warm hat, but it's also an intellectual exercise. It is with a cool hat, and both are needed in these times. As Nick, maybe I surprised you, you said, uh, when I said, does Brexit do anything? And I said, no. Brexit does not do anything. The processes and the forces that drive Brexit, that keep in this sort of a signposted or symbolic way of the, the actions of these votes, etc., the underlying forces that make us discuss something like Brexit are more important than the event itself. How unhappy it is. Second thing I want to say is, I'm an avowed European archaeologist. I'm a lifelong member of EA, and I'm proud to say I have been invited by the Institute years ago to be a member of, at that stage, IFA. And it has enriched my life to no small extent, I would even say it almost has defined my life, in the modern set experience in meeting you of who I am and why I'm standing here. I've never been so busy with this subject. My wife was sort of bored with it. Normally I don't talk with it, but I was sounding off on her. This is what makes hopefully us, but especially me, tick. So, there we go. I want to write a book about the archaeology of happiness. If someone gives me the money, please do, because I'm struggling to get it. And the first sentence of the book is already written. This is a book about a fool's quest. I will fail to define, I'm convinced already, to define the archaeology of happiness. But it's worth the journey. So, new journey. Use your crooks. Not interesting. Absolutely not interesting. There is this also this, this, this thing of hope. Ray, the Dutch have saved us. The Dutch have been a dam against uh, this anti-European thing. Oh, sanity has come. Absolutely not. As Mr. Müller says, good populism beat bad in Dutch elections. But it's sad in the orange, appropriately orange banner there, authoritarianism and nativism were the real winners in the Netherlands polls. The whole of the Dutch spectrum has moved towards Geerwilders. So, the problem is still there, and the danger is still there. To quote a certain American president, misquote I have to say, it is not the economy, poverty, unemployment, contact with foreigners, stupid. It is about totally different things. Why is it that affluent, wealthy people, well-educated people vote for wills or vote for Brexit? It is not the people with a lot of foreigners now. People vote for all kinds of reasons, but not these. So most of our ways of looking at this, and the analysis, uh, uh, to, uh, if you analyze it, are not about these factors. It goes deeper. Surprise, sort of a mix-up. What makes sense? What should have made sense, what should have been reasonable, was that Hillary Rodham Clinton would have been the president. And what would have been reasonable is what everyone expected about the outcome of Brexit. That would have been reasonable. And I'm a great fan of reason. Just in a sidestep, with sort of this, this company got me thinking that this company was sort of the start point of this exercise and made me put in an abstract to, to Rob and Nick. This is a part of the website of a firm called Cambridge Analytical. It is a firm which says a comprehensive range of analytics and engagement services are proven game changers that deliver smart solutions and produce real results. Which results? What are we referring to? Getting Trump elected, getting the Brexit going. They are the game changers and they are playing a very smart and intellectual challenging game. They have found an algorithm to define most of us. I have shocking news. If you have 300 likes on Facebook, they harvest it 
and they tell you your gender, your race, your sexual orientation, your makeup of your family, your hobbies, your fears, what makes you tick, your income. 300 likes. It's science, hard science. And they use it. And therefore, you have this thing of the bubbles. Because they don't spread their information or their triggering effect, the play on emotions, to me, I'm not interested. I get different things in the bubble. But the people on the edge of the boat, the people who switch from, well, maybe it is, maybe not, they bombard with stories about how bad things are. Uh, they come up with these straight banana thing, etc. They, they mold these people. And it's not even important that they, these people vote differently, but for instance, you can tip the scale by letting them not vote, or not vote for the other uh, uh, candidate. So we are not even aware what they're doing. And they're very small and very analytical and they're very business-like about it. Probably if Labour would help them, and if they would hire them, they would probably work for Labour. And the left or the Liberals could play the same game if you pay them enough. And what they do is, they go deeper than reason. They use, and they use our emotions. They use, as Tim would call it, the chimp in us. Tim is very much in favor of calling it the chimpanzee, the, the deeper emotive state of humans. And there are different, and, and I'm not a psychologist, and, but I use the most simple, basic thing about our emotions. You're mad, you're glad, you're scared, or you're sad. And somewhere defined along these axes, your, your state of mind is there. And probably the strongest, to my conviction, is fear. And if you can trigger fear within groups of people, if you can push them in a sort of a direction, they uh, have, uh, they have oh, power over you. If they can get a grip to the chimp, if they can sort of force you to run or whatever, you will make irrational choices. Uh, in that sense, I would like to thank everyone who has kindly apologized to me over the last three days for the Brexit results. <laughs> it's a highly illogical act. You felt the need to apologize to me? <laughs> I don't blame you. There may be people here sort of hiding their idea that Brexit is a good idea. I have no beef with you. I like you. I'm that fool that is interested in people and like almost everyone. It's pretty difficult <coughs> for me to, to hate someone. Uh, I think even I could have a, a jolly good time with Mr. Trump. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it would be a very interesting meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm deeply interested in what makes him tick. I will not vote for him. That's a totally different thing. Being interested in someone else is not saying he's right and therefore I have to vote or, not, or I have to believe in. No. It's about understanding. And we are therefore and it, the system is pretty simple if you are happy, yeah? and that's why I not believe the system. If you're happy, you can sort of move things this way. If, you're, if, if there's enough happiness, if there's not trust, if there's enough confidence to sort of dampen down the other trees, which are mostly negative, then you sort of can progress and, and believe in your future. Oh, stop. What about reason? What about our accomplishments as Western European civilization? What about intellect? What about the Enlightenment? I am a great, great believer of the throne of reason. In my core being, I have many things, but one part of my core being is reason. And my personal fall from grace from that kind of thing was getting ill. Being taken over, it's called a burnout, and I'm pretty public about it, so it can be on the net or whatever. I don't care. But my, my caring for others, my caring, my will to drive a, an agenda, to care for others, uh, to help a struggling firm, to be a kind husband, to be careful about all these things, put me in a bind. And my emotions took over. And emotions, my emotions stopped me. There I was sitting, looking at a screen, and my emotions told, told me, you cannot do anything. And my reason 
was sort of thing, ah, that's a burnout. And there I was sitting with a reasonable explanation and inaction. And for six months, I could kill elephants every morning when I stood next to my bed. Every morning I was filled up with all kinds of emotions. And there I am, who considered myself the most reasonable person in many occasions, etc., etc. The voice of reason, the voice of calm, etc., etc. It's what I call my elephant strangling days. I'm totally convinced I could have strangled the elephant next to that. My favorite saying, and I put it for a reason in German, gegen Dummheit kämpfen Götter selbst vergebens. That's even the favorite saying of my father, Dr. Stupidity, stupidity is something you cannot fight. So it's, it's an affirmation of what I am, but it's also a sort of a, a throwing away of, of all these other people who are not very intellectual or whatever. And I highlight here, uh, who thought it, I think, is very important in our European thinking as well. What it has to do with, with a professional institute, where we're here. What it has to do for us as professional archaeologists. Why should we be co as concerned about emotion? Why should we care about it? We're there to deliver the good, and we have lofty schemes, etc., etc. I'm talking too long about all these points, but here we go. It's awareness. I just quote something which you have to do if you want to become a MIFA. You have to have your awareness, and it, it says you have a high level of understanding of the overall picture. That's asked of a MIFA, a member of this institute. Picture between practice. You must be aware of all kinds of forces which are playing there. Favorite thing. You have to understand that we and the rest of society work with big lies. Big lies are beneficial. This is also a big lie, but it's not the lie I'm meaning. A big lie is beneficial. This is the biggest lie I know. <laughs> Sinterklaas exists. And everyone in the Netherlands, even the people who are against Black Peter, etc., nobody rocks the boat. Everyone is there aware of his role and his responsibility to tell children Sinterklaas exists. It's pretty easy to disprove. <laughs> we do this. It's a strong, emotive, forming thing in Dutch culture. Valletta, oh, true, all true there, all very reasonable, etc., etc. Biggest liar of our profession. In situ. No, not. We want to dig. If we would have been successful in Article 4, we should stop digging. Why are we telling this? There are reasons. The sad thing is some of them, of us, and especially the public, start to believe this. Another one. Ensuring that archaeologists participate. This is before the Faro days. Suitable selections. Who is there to say suitable? What's suitable? Oh. And of course there is Faro. But one of the aspects of the latter days, I could say, is that Faro is well read, well liked by archaeologists, but it's not very well implemented in many European countries or contexts. I'm nice. <laughs> <laughs> what we tell others, in short, is archaeology is important. It adds quality to your life. This is your or our past we are researching. Archaeology has its own inherent value. It is for everyone. So it's worth paying for by someone else. <laughs> this is the same as the, these, these F words, something, something, in the European Parliament. These people far away, which sort of says, you have to do this. You have to be that. And they are also used as scapegoats. I'm very much aware. But emotionally, they are the distant people who don't care. They are the people who say to British farmers, you have to use other products. You have to use uh, your land in a different way. And therefore, they will change the view of the British landscape. And therefore, it's not like if you for 17 years, you have looked out over this kind of landscape and your parents and your grandfather have grown those crops and suddenly someone in Brussels says, nope, you have to do different. You get an emotive reaction. Nothing wrong with the flag of St. George. And I hear Ray already grunting. Huh? I show it, there is this reaction. The change, the narrative, this idea of I'm allowed 
to be who I am in this Europe. Uh, it is good to be English, Dutch, uh, German, whatever. This thing is for many a, a person a thing which touches on their sense of self. They have the feeling, unreasonably, but they have the deep emotional feeling, I have no right to exist in this state. Someone else is deciding that I should change and that other people are more important. And then you get angry people. Even good news, I would say. Ancient genomes reveal that the English are one-third Anglo-Saxon. Only one-third. The rest of them are... This, this, these people, lab-coded people, experts are telling you, yeah, you're not Anglo-Saxon. Well, you only have a chance of a third. Sorry about that, but that's the truth. The truth is unpalatable. It's reasonable, but it makes you not, it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't affirm you in who you are. It tells you, uh, oh, you're something else. Yeah, we just sort of decide what you are, but you're definitely not English. That's science. Yeah. English to that core. You have to reasonably explain it, but that's the thing. Of course we reach out. Of course we do good things. This is uh, Telford Park, Paul knows this, uh, community activity. Of course we reach out. Of course we are aware that, that different stories are more important, but they're very limited. And I, for one, have not seen a uh, community archaeology project in a well-to-do neighborhood with lots of villas of people with an income and, uh, let's say, the highest tech bracket. So the access to ar archaeology brings us to, you have to be deprived, a youngie, youngie, I'm sort of doing the cafe talk with someone of an IQ of 80 in Amsterdam. Right? Oh, the Turks get everything. The same thing can be said that here to the axis of archaeology. You have to be deprived or poor or handicapped, but if you are in your right mind, what's your chance to prosper? Pretty good, you have to look for it, but that's a feeling, that's an emotive thing which is going on. We are common as mark. I have bad news for us, and I'm not feeling comfortable with it, but we are part of the elite. We are seen as part of the problem. We can argue we are not, we can argue that we are from different backgrounds, a diversity, etc. But we are perceived as part of the elite. We are those, again, the F word. We have taught these people, we, eh, the West has taught these people, that they would have something like these things. Freedom of speech, well, we use that. Freedom of, of worship, well, not that important anymore. Eh, but people are going to churches. Freedom from want? Well, there things become a bit iffy. People are worried. Yes, they live in nice houses, but can they still live in nice houses? Can their children live in these nice houses? Freedom from fear? That's definitely what we're not able to achieve at this moment. People are very fearful and therefore lash out. What's the best place uh, for us archaeologists to be? What makes us tick? What is, what is the Best place for us to be. Most of you, you don't dare to answer, but the answer is, I will give it to you, <laughs> is in the field. And I would say, again, this is one of our beneficial big lies. Because we are most comfortable, most in our strength, <laughs> there. In a social meeting, the drinking is only a part of that or whatever, but having together, reaching out together, have a bond sort of unexplainable and touching other people, people with the same interest. That's the fun part in archaeology. And that's part of the storytelling, that's the part of the connectivity of it. This is our public. And I have to say, I don't want to part of the public. I have been known to wear urns quite a bit. When Holland plays, and it's wrong to call it Holland, but when Holland plays, I don't wear urns. I really don't. I I was wearing orange ones, and I said, they're playing. And I looked at myself, and I went home, and I changed. I don't want part of the horde, and to put it in that perspective. But these are the people who want to have a, a piece of me as well. They want to have archaeology as well. And luckily for me, I'm very much interested in football stadiums and, and the social structures around me. So I have a common ground to meet them, and it's great. I really like the archaeology of football stadiums. Absolutely fascinating. Just like you have a great connection to 
the brutalist building. And it doesn't mind if they're ugly, it is the story about them which made us and them tick. We could be yeah, funny, nice, just be comfortable. We could also sort of ignore the rest of the group. We could do have the fun bit there. But you see, there's a very mixed audience, and no, there is not an open day. This is just people who heard that we were digging and had game. We are attractive. We are fun people to be. We have a sort of an emotive connection there. They want to have a piece of us. And it brought me to something which I'll not address because I think it's not fun or good. It's public philosophy. Read up on about it. I will not talk about it because it brings us again in this expert role. I want to talk about happiness. Happiness is driving these kinds of things. We are not do-gooders. We are people interested in other people, even living people. We should reach out by, not perhaps town teams, but be accessible. This was such a great thing because these people became characters. They became, it's not good archaeology, but people got the impression of it. Our highest ambition should be that once a year, someone of us is on the Graham Norton show and have this moment to be funny and relevant. That's what makes the world tick for a lot of people. Don't hack it. I am totally over time. How? I haven't figured it out. But this is... We are these, these people who carve up perfectly good land. We are carving up our part, their part of history. We are the enemy, but you can reach out. I have anecdotal evidence. Who will pay for it? They won't. We will not get paid. I only ask you to be part of this exercise and do what you love to do. Just chat to people, talk to them, explain to them how history and, and archaeology work, works. Don't get caught by the market forces. Don't believe what we tell each other of what is good archaeology in the commercial surroundings, etc. Follow your heart. Go on the emotive track. Don't forget the reason. Great heroes of mine, philosophers, look at the eyes especially of Bertrand Russell. Those are kind eyes, they're friendly eyes. This is a rationalist. They're superheroes of their time. I would ask the Institute to join me, us, in this more emotive way of, well, having fun, having more emotions in our work and well, reaping the benefits of ourselves. The credo should be, I believe archaeology is fun. Sharing is needing. Together is more fun. Yes, we can attain paradise. On earth. In the now. And we need a role model. And the role model, the fool is not. The fool is a wise man. And I will go over time. I will take it up. The fool is an interesting, interesting person. He's because, I have to point this out, sorry. Uh, no, I'll try to do this on, on the board here. See this? this? This zero, the zero is not nothing. Of the major arcana, and it, I'm not talking tarot, I'm talking symbolism. It's not part of the major arcana. It's the joker. It is the most powerful card in the deck. There is this rose. Oh gosh, where it is, here. The, you saw the rose, I'm not going to bother with it. You saw the rose which says you are free of wants, of constraints of this time. You are a man, a woman, which goes out. There is also a bag there. The bag stands for the collective, undiscovered knowledge of all. The fool is not mad. The fool is an example we should take. The fool is an archetype we should embrace. And I will ask you very kindly, as fellow archaeologist, fellow man, to join me on another fool's quest. Thank you.